I want to begin the service today with a poem by Chris Paravicini. She's a Wyoming cowgirl and the author of The Cowboy Wedding. In her poem, she likens the marriage of a man and woman to the pairing of two draft horses. I hope you enjoy it. You gotta talk cowboy to follow this tale. You gotta roll in the corral dust, not sit on top of rail. The heart and the spirit of the sublet lies here in cowboys and ranchers, though progress is near. Yes, this poem, my friend, is in cowboy tongue, about mating a team so fresh and young. A wedding took place in the wild old west, and all the good folk were their Saturday best. A lively green pair together are hitched, and the singular life they both have ditched. This, the bride was lovely in dress of white, the groom so handsome that magic night. The minister sealed the marriage, then a pickup truck was the chosen carriage. After vittles and cake, in the reception hall, the band played first dance, and all had a ball. The music they played was grand and sweet as guests took a whirl to a boot scootin' beat. The groom's now harnessed and works on the grass. The bride's on the left, the most fortunate lass, a team not mirror each other at all. If the harmony's yoked, be it large or small. Each load that they start will be pulled together if one should fall the tongues held by the other. And when life's great tasks seem be rough locked, an honest team won't sulk or balk. They'll lean forward as one, keep their tugs up tight. With the right kind of luck, things will turn out right. The couple thanks family and friends so true for their help celebrating this union brand new. When a hitchin' occur occurs, it's a might grand change. Say, this honeymoon couple's now home on the range. Today we're going to be considering a marriage, it won't be a cowboy wedding. Sorry that all the Western theme will end right here. But as we look at this wedding today, I want you to expect something grand and glorious because Jesus Christ is going to be wed to his bride. I want you to hear all about it. But before we begin, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come meet in the homes of these folk who are watching online, I pray, Lord, that your presence will be felt as if they're in the sanctuary at First Baptist Church. We pray that you may show yourself to each of us so that we may celebrate the great opportunity that lies before us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. This morning, I want to talk about the church. How many of you have heard this at your house? Hurry up, it's time to go to church. Come on, we're gonna be late. We gotta get to church. Have you heard that? I know I've said it before. And that makes it sound like the church is the building that we go to. But the church is not the building. Some of you may not know this, and I want, to sh I want to show you something, but I bet your parents and your grandparents know it, because it's something we used to do. We used to put our hands like this. I want you to do this. Can you put your fingers together, kind of intertwine them, and shut it? So we would go like this. We would say, here's the church, and then we put our two fingers up. Here's the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. You got that? Do it like this. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door and see all the people. See, the church is not the building with the doors and the steeple. The church is the people that's in it. You know, our church is name where we gather is called First Baptist Church of Parkersburg. 
But it's not the building, although we have a beautiful building. It's the people that attend there. It's the people that make up the church. The Bible uses different words to even describe the church. One of the phrases that it uses is that the church is the bride of Christ. Do you know what a bride is? Have you ever been to a wedding? The, the, the woman walks down the aisle in this beautiful gown and at the front is the groom. So in the Bible, it describes the church as the bride. I'm not gonna get into that a whole lot because Pastor Rich is gonna be talking about that a little bit more. I wanna talk about another phrase that the Bible uses to describe the church. The Bible calls it the body of Christ, with Jesus being the head, but the church, the people, are the arms, the hands, the feet. So what does that mean? We're supposed to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. We're supposed to be sharing God's love. We're supposed to be doing things for people and telling other people and taking care of people and, and making them aware who God is. We're supposed to be on mission. So when you hear the word church, I don't want you to think about the doors and the steeple. I want you to think about all the people and that we are supposed to be on mission telling others about God's love. Thank you. 
America seems to love it when a guy makes one of those bold public marriage proposals. In a restaurant with a staff in on it, the guy drops to a knee for a public proposal. One guy took his girlfriend up in a hot air balloon and had written in a field, Will you marry me? There was a guy who had his proposal displayed on the scoreboard at a halftime pro football game. I would hope that a guy is pretty sure of himself when he takes this kind of risk. Can you imagine getting turned down on national television? Earlier this year, anchor Julian Pavlika was in the middle of reading a script along with her co-anchors for the day's news, but she did not seem to know that it was her own marriage proposal that she was reading. She spoke to the camera on live television saying, we have some breaking news for you. Fox 54 has just learned that a Huntsville news anchor is being proposed to on live TV right now. We love a good proposal story, don't we? Well, those proposals are nothing compared to the way that Jesus proposed to you and me. All eyes were on you as he fell to his knees. He threw open his arms wide and said, I love you this much. You're to die for. And then he died for you. The good news is that Jesus didn't stay dead. He got up from the grave. He continued with his disciples for 40 more days before it was time to leave them and listen to how the scripture records his final words. Now, when he, Jesus, had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in a like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Did you catch that? Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back for you. The Bible's clear about the fact that he's returning. The details surrounding that return are open for debate. Some make great forecasts and watch for the signs indicating a date or a set of circumstances. But God did not provide a time for Christ's return. Rather, over and over and over again, he said, be ready. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them, of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take enough oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said uh, to the others, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. And while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. You and I are to be ready for Christ's return. He could come tomorrow while you were going about your daily routine. He could come tonight while you're asleep. He could come this morning and interrupt our worship service. Are you prepared? Are you ready? There's a marriage about to happen, and we must be prepared. Christ is coming, and when he does, Christ will be united with his bride, the church, you. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. 
Here's a thought for you. Jesus Christ, the Savior of your eternal soul, the one who suffered and bled and died for you, the one who pledged your life, the one you pledged your life to serve, the Holy Son of the living God, could come for his bride at any moment, and many of you are not prepared. You made Jesus the Lord of your life. You said he was the only one for you. You said you'd serve him forever, that you'd have no other gods before him. And yet, you've been caught on camera with other lovers. You've been flirting with lust, stretching the truth, sleeping with the enemy, courting other lovers behind his back. The wedding date is closer than ever, and you're two-timing Jesus. You agreed to keep yourself pure until the wedding. You can't dance with the devil and expect to marry the king. Jesus is coming back for you. And when he does, he will be united with his bride. You. Is there anyone present who may give just cause why these two should not be united in marriage? The book of Revelation gives us some insight into what it will be like when he comes. The first several chapters describe the readiness of seven churches. To Ephesus, he says, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. This is a church that was not ready for Christ's return. Oh, at one time, they enjoyed a relationship with Christ, but more recently, they seemed to be going through the motions. Something was missing from their relationship. The love was gone. The church had succumbed to organizational existence without any passion for their purpose. The love had gone out of their relationship. Do you remember what Christ said to them? Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Most of us can understand how this church feels. Christ is likening his relationship. <coughs> Christ is likening his relationship with them to a marriage. It's a marriage of habit, of duty, of living in the same house, but the love is gone. You and I, if we're neglecting our love for Christ, know what we must do. We must remember the heights from which we've fallen. Repent from neglecting our relationship with Christ and return to a love relationship with him. That's how we'll be ready for his return. I have officiated at many weddings at First Baptist. Before each wedding ceremony, I conduct three counseling sessions. Couples are fun to get to know during this time. They're full of expectation. They're in love. Typically, the bride knows exactly what she wants. The groom often has that look that says whatever she wants. It's that way on the day of the ceremony as well. She arrives early and prepares herself for the day that she has dreamed of all of her life. He arrives late saying over and over, what have I gotten myself into? She is all smiles. He is a bundle of nerves. She has planned every detail from the rehearsal dinner to the ceremony, to the reception, to the pictures. He's only thinking about the honeymoon. She's ready to enjoy the greatest day of her life. He's thinking about leaving. The guys at the wedding party know this and joke with him about an escape plan. The father of the bride offers him money to call it all off. But weddings are fun. <clears throat> Unlike our weddings, however, the Bible says that it's the groom who has planned every detail of this marriage. Listen to how he has envisioned the wedding gown. He compares it to a city. One of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of every precious jewel. 
like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three great uh, gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, as wide and high as it is long. He measured its wall and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper and a city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysoprase, the eleventh, jacinth, and the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of pure gold, like transparent glass. That's the description of the bride of Christ in Revelation 21. This is what you and I will look like to Jesus on that day. It's hard to imagine, but you and I will be so beautiful to him as a bride walking down the aisle as to her bridegroom. Max Lucado tells a story of ages past about a stately prince and a peasant girl who fall in love. This really a different one, a difficult one to understand. On one hand is a prince who literally had the world at his disposal. There had never been a more perfect specimen of a man that ever lived. Nothing about him was common. You wouldn't be exaggerating to say that he is a perfect catch. On the other hand, there's a peasant girl. She's nothing more than average. At her best, she is plain, but at her worst, she can just be plain ugly. There are times when she is cranky and moody, and she rarely ever achieves all she could. To look at her from anyone else's eyes, you would never believe she was worth much. But if you could see her through the eyes of the prince, you would believe that she is to die for. Because the prince determined that he couldn't bear to live without her, he asked her to be his bride. The angels in heaven listened expectantly as she accepted his proposal. The prince promised his bride that he would come back for her soon, and the peasant-turned-princess pledged to faithfully await his return. To this point, the story could be any of a number of fairy tales, but now the plot takes a bizarre twist. You would expect the bride to always be thinking about the coming wedding, but she rarely ever mentions it. You would think that her every waking moment would be lived out in anticipation and preparation for the coming of her prince. However, by the way she lives, you wouldn't even know she's the bride of a perfect prince. More frequently than not, you can't even tell the difference between the bride and any of the other peasant girls in the village. There are even times when she can be seen flirting with the other men of the village in broad daylight. And who knows what she's doing when nobody is around to see. Can you imagine a peasant girl fortunate enough to be the object of a perfect prince's eternal love? You would expect her to be captivated by his love and filled with a sense of wonder that she was fortunate enough to be loved by him. You would think that she would be careful to remain pure in anticipation of the love of her royal groom. Instead, to look at her, you might wonder if she even remembers she's engaged at all. How could a peasant forget about her prince? Is it possible for a bride to forget her groom? 
In the fifth chapter of Ephesians, Paul tells or gives instructions about how a husband and a wife are, re are to relate to one another. He challenges Christian couples to live in such a way that the wife respects and submits to her husband. And the husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. As a matter of fact, several times in Ephesians, Paul relates the relationship between the husband and wife to the relationship between Christ and the church. Listen to what he says. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now catch what he says now in verse 32. This is a profound ministry, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Notice what Paul is saying. It's not that the relationship of the husband and wife is a picture of how Christ and the church are to relate to one another. Instead, Paul says that the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church, is a model for the Christian couple. Christ served and was willing to die for his bride. The church serves and submits out of love and appreciation for the sacrifice Christ made on our behalf. The basis of the relationship grows out of verse 21, where Paul said, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. If you want to know how Christian people ought to relate to one another, the model is the way Christ and the church relate as a groom and his bride. Are you living every day in preparation for a time when you will be united with Christ? Christ is prepared. In fact, in John 14, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many rooms, or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm going there to, to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Jesus is spending this time in anticipation of the wedding day when he will come back and claim his bride. He is preparing the place that you and I will call home for eternity. Now the question that every one of us must answer is, what am I going to do to prepare myself for his return? As we wait for that day, the invitation is open. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let everyone who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. That invitation is for you. Will you come? Let's pray. What a marvelous picture it is, God, that we are the bride, and that your son is the bridegroom. We would not want to do anything that would mess up our wedding day. God, help us to be prepared. Help us to be ready. Help us to come when you say come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.